this offseason. Brian Kelly leaving Notre Dame as its all-time winningest coach to take the LSU job was one of the most shocking developments in college football. It's the type of event that could have fractured a program, but anyone who believes that underestimated the player's devotion to Kelly's successor, Marcus Freeman. I'm ready for this challenge, and I'm ready to lead this program to the greatest heights. And as a team and as a family, we will accomplish all of our goals. If you need any evidence of whether the Fighting Irish would keep their national appeal, look no further than the 2023 recruiting class. I'll be committing to the University of Notre Dame. Go Irish. Coach staff is great. The environment was great. Being able to play at the highest level of football and compete academically is super special. It's not a four-year plan. It's a forever plan. We know Marcus Freeman is an elite recruiter, but he will have his work cut out for him with Notre Dame's schedule. The first Saturday of November, they'll contend with the perennial powerhouse of the ACC, the Clemson Tigers, and finish the campaign at the Coliseum against the New Look Trojans. But all focus is on week one, with Freeman making his regular season debut at the shoe against the Buckeyes. What better way to measure where your football program is week one than playing a great team like Ohio State? As for who will be under center for that titanic clash, it's likely a two-horse race between Tyler Buckner and Drew Pine, who both offer unique skill sets. Whoever wins the job will no doubt look to find All-American tight end Michael Mayer early and often in one of the most raucous environments college football has to offer. Can the Fighting Irish pull off the upset and perhaps lock up a playoff spot in year one under Freeman? It's a whole new era in South Bend, the Freeman era. You heard his voice. Here he is in the flesh. Brady Quinn, Notre Dame's all-time leading passer. Marcus Freeman has done a great job on the recruiting trail. Number one ranked class next year and the year after that. How about this year, though, and taking over a program this day and age with so many moving pieces around college football? And that's the biggest thing. In order to keep these recruiting classes together, you have to have success on the field. You can only, you know, pitch and promote so much. So that's the biggest thing. And I think, look, I don't care if you've coached your entire career. It's a challenge to go to one of the major Power Five programs take it over and try to win a national championship right now and compete with the likes of Alabama and Nick Saban. But that's the challenge when you're at Notre Dame or any of those other large Power Five programs. But Marcus Freeman obviously is, is ready for this. I think you see that with the way he has been able to recruit. Uh, not only that, but assemble a staff and keep that staff together from Brian Kelly picking them away to go to LSU. And on top of that, you see that he has a genuine connection with the team. I mean, when they announced that he was the next head coach, you could see the excitement. You feel a different energy now around campus. And so all that's changed. And I think, honestly, this could be something where instead of breaking it and knocking it all back down and building it back up, you're building off of the foundation that Brian Kelly had created. And you're now saying to yourself, maybe it is the energy that we need from Marcus Freeman that lead it, can lead us to a national championship. But, you know, the toughest thing I think for him is, is now game management. You know, you go from a former defensive coordinator and, and play caller on one side of the football to having to oversee the entire thing and managing your staff. And if you haven't done it before, he's only done it for one postseason game, it's a difficult task to do. Number six, uh, excuse me, number six in our preseason, I got choked up. Number six in our preseason CBS Sports uh, rankings. And in, in the main thing they got to figure out is what are they doing at quarterback? Jack Cohn is gone. Uh, what's the quarterback battle as it stands right now? Well, you're, you're dealing between Tyler Buckner, who we saw a little bit situationally last year. He's a more athletic, obviously a dual-threat quarterback who can utilize his legs. And then Drew Pine, who came in at times in relief of Jack Cohn, who's more of that pocket passer that you're looking for. But each of them has that own, their own skill set to it. And I think you go back to some of the games you saw last year. I was there in person to see you know, Drew Pine play. You know, the way he would sling the football around and bring an energy to that team, almost like a little, you know, kind of light a fire underneath that group. Uh, he was decisive with the football, and, and I think he's got a good feel for the offense given how long he's been there. You know, Buckner's going to bring much more of that athleticism that you're looking for now in today's game, running the football, keeping the, four, uh, the football and a lot of the quarterback design runs. Uh, and that's the element that I think will be interesting to see how it would match up with what has already been a pretty dominant rushing attack for Notre Dame. Haven't had a thousand yard receiver since Chase Claypool in 2019. I think you had multiple thousand yard receivers in one year yeah. back in 2005 with Notre Dame. Who's going to emerge at wide receiver this year, you think? It's tough, especially when you've got an All American tight end of Michael Mayer, right? Like every read should go through him first, and then you figure out who's going to emerge up on the outside. But it's an interesting group because I think you got some veteran guys there, like an Avery Davis who's coming back, and Braden Lindsay who's got a lot of experience there. But you also have a lot of young wide receivers who could add to this group. Uh, it could be Deion Colsey, for example, or looking through the roster, Jaden Thomas, Lorenzo Styles, who I think flashed last year a number of times, and even Tobias Merriweather, their freshmen. So they've got a lot of guys, I think, on their roster that are capable of doing it. 
It's just about first figuring out who the quarterback is that's throwing the football. And then once you have that, seeing who's going to be that reliable, consistent wide receiver that he can trust and have confidence in in making that big play. On defense, Al Golden is now the defensive coordinator. First time he's been in college since he was the head coach at Miami back in 2015. Spent the past few seasons in the NFL as an assistant. Kyle Hamilton, one of the best defensive players in the country, is gone to the NFL. How do you fill his void? Well, it's a big void to fill, but they do have a special, talented player in Brandon Joseph who's transferred over from Northwestern. So he's not the same type of player, but I think Al Golden's going to be able to utilize him in a variety of ways like you saw them utilize with Kyle Hamilton just a year ago. But the biggest thing is what little sprinkles uh, Al Golden's going to bring in that are different from what Marcus Freeman has done in the past because he's going to have autonomy over the defense. Uh, but keep an eye on Isaiah Foskey. He's one of the best edge rushers in the country. He's a guy that Al Golden's going to rely on oftentimes as just a four-man rush to be able to get pressure off of the edge. And I think he's in for a big year, and he's very capable of being a guy that we're talking about in the first round of next year's draft. Well, they got to hit the ground running this season, of course, going to Ohio State to start the year. Three standout games on the schedule. You got the trip to Ohio State. You got the trip to USC end of the season. Yeah. And also Clemson, the ACC favorite as well. Yeah, look, it's, it's always a tough schedule when you're at Notre Dame. You know that as an independent, you're going to schedule things that way. And you see the BYU game highlighted in Las Vegas. That's a good football team. That's going to be a challenge for your team as well, amongst some of the others that are sprinkled in there. But it all comes down to September 3rd. And look, the reality is Ohio State next to Bama, those are the top two teams in college football. Notre Dame is going to have a tough time in a really you know, tough environment with 100,000 plus people uh, at night in prime time be able to winning that football game. And so it really comes down to if they don't win that game, how do you respond? You know, I do think this team is very much capable of at least winning nine games, if not winning potentially 11 running the table if they drop that game to Ohio State. I think they've got enough talent there in the right spots. It's all about how they respond if they stumble there in week one. Does it matter if you lose by one or you lose by 21? First year head coach, first game of the season. How could that affect things depending on how much they lose by, considering they're going to be a double digit favorite? Yeah, no, I, I think there's definitely a, a thought or consideration to, you know, this is kind of like in horseshoes, where like how close it might kind of matter, at least in the psyche of a lot of those players and, and for that team. I mean, remember, you're, you're starting a new quarterback too. I mean, him being broken in on the road and dealing with that environment. That's going to play a lot into his psyche and what they think about themselves moving forward. I mean, Ohio State is picked to win the Big Ten. In my opinion, they're picked to play against Alabama to eventually play for the national championship. And so if you're able to be toe-to-toe -to -toe with them right out the gate, I think it's a strong sign for, to be quite honest with you, a roster that's got a lot of young pieces. And if you can compete with the likes of them week one, you'd only think that you're taking off and building up from there. Right now, Ohio State a 14-and-a-half-point favorite in that game at home against Notre Dame, which is just about three weeks away or so. Win total is set at nine. Oh, hammer the over. I mean, like I said, I think the floor for this team is nine wins. I mean, let's we looked at their schedule. You go back over that, even if they drop the Ohio State, Clemson, USC game, which I don't think they're going to drop all three, I think they'll be over this number. But even if you did, you're sitting there to push. So – I think things have scheduled out for them to be successful this season. I mean, Tommy Reese coming back as their offensive coordinator to me is a huge key cog in all of this, keeping that continuity, an offensive line that's got a bunch of maulers up front and a very talented backfield with Chris Tyree and the likes of Logan Diggs on top of what potentially could be at the quarterback possession too and adding to that, and again, an All-American tight end of Michael Mayer. They've got weapons. We talked about Foskey on defense and the addition of Brandon Joseph. This is also a group that's got some experience on, on that side of the football. So uh, this team is built to win. It's just a matter of how they're going to handle some of the adversity that they may face after that big matchup week one. Five straight years, Notre Dame has won 10-plus games in the regular season. Five straight years, they would go over this number of nine, but a difficult schedule. When you look at the playoff odds, I was a bit surprised to see this. Notre Dame coming in, they were fifth in the coaches' poll. We haven't seen the AP yet. They're number six in our rankings. But college football playoff odds, they slot in at 12th. There are 11 teams with better odds to make the college football playoff than Notre Dame. What do you think of that 11-1 to 1 number to make the playoff? The one thing that's always going to be against them is obviously they don't have that 13th game indicator, right? They're not playing when everyone else, a lot of these teams will probably be playing for their conference championships. So that's something that's going to be voting against you. And now you can always make the case that, hey, they've gotten in without that. We've seen that in past years. 
I think there's a lot of people who are factoring in a week one loss versus Ohio State. I think because of that, they're saying, even if they run the table, you're still going to be a behind that Ohio State team. That, yeah, if they win the Big Ten, that's great, because I think that's more of a feather in your cap. But if they don't, you can't put Notre Dame in over Ohio State, if that's the case. If they're a one loss, potentially, but they don't win their division uh, type scenario that plays out in Michigan, let's say they go to the Big Ten Championship out of the East. In that scenario, though, they wouldn't be getting in over Ohio State. So I think there's a lot of assumption as to what's going to happen week one. And then looking at the fact that they're not a part of a conference, so there's really not much room for error within their schedule. I mean, maybe you get one freebie versus Ohio State and things work out for you, but you can't lose two. And that's the tough part for them is they don't have a conference to win to give them that 13th game indicator. Is this a bad year to have to start at Ohio State? Well, I, I think you'd make the case that it's, it's probably a bad year for any team to have to start at Ohio State. Yeah. I mean, look, the way they lost last year, uh, the loss to Michigan, and I was, I was there for that. I mean, they got physically beat up. They got beat up and down the field on both sides of the football. I think they've got something to prove. Talk about Ohio State. Ohio State. I think Ryan Day, you know, steps back, looked at it, obviously brought a new defensive coordinator, Jim Knowles. He understands the toughness, the things they need to bring to the table. I think they looked at it from an offensive standpoint. What they need to get back to doing is running the football as, as great as it looks when they're out there throwing for a bunch of yards. It still hasn't necessarily equated to the success they had in 2014 when they won the national championship with a running attack with Zeke Elliott. So I think they'd like to get back to doing some of that. Usually the Big Ten championship winner is going to be leading the conference in rushing. It's going to be one of the more better defensive teams. That was not Ohio State last year. They've got a lot to prove, and I think whether it's Notre Dame or anyone else, they probably don't want to see this, this ticked off Ohio State team coming in week one. Notre Dame win total set at nine. Brady Quinn says hammer the hammer over. It. Bring out, where is, where is uh, Doyle? Oh, Tim Doyle Tim with Doyle the hammer? hammer? Bring it out because uh, the floor is nine wins for this team, according to Brady. That'll at least get you a push. Brady Quinn with us here as we count down the top teams in college football. Tomorrow we move on to Clemson as we start our countdown of the top five teams all the way to Alabama at number one. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.